morning, everyone. The Lord be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome members and friends here this morning, whether physically in this place or watching online. We hope that joining us for worship today will nurture your heart and transform your mind. If you are new to Beulah, we hope you'll join us again and again and consider any of our mission, fellowship, and education opportunities. To that end, would you please sign the who's who found in your pew and leave the con for, uh, contact information so that we can reach out to you. If you're interested in becoming a member of Beulah, please speak with the pastor or one of the greeters at the door or telephone the church office. The church's contact info is found in the bulletin announcements. Guess what? Today's the picnic, the annual picnic. And I'm dressed up because we don't have to sit in the grass and worry about bugs. We go straight over to the Ramsey building. There's so much food that if you didn't bring anything, it's okay. Just come and join us and have a good time. It's going to be a relaxed fellowship, and we hope you all enjoy. There are 10 spots that remain to attend the Derby Dinner Playhouse. Uh, the play is Annie, and it's on August 11th. If you're interested in going, please sign up in the church lobby and pay by placing a check in the offering plate or mail to the church office. The Red Cross Blood Drive is here on Monday, July 8th. Refer to announcements for details. Church directories are available on the shelf in the church lobby. Fern Creek Highview United Ministries is collecting school supplies again this year. Check the bulletin board in the lobby or the announcement sheet for a detailed list of items needed. Now I'd like to invite you all to stand in body or in spirit for the call to worship and prayer. We trust that the Lord is with us, and all shall be made well. Our faith is the light that guides us through work, life, and the world. Rejoice and know that God is here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you show us the breadth of your power and the depth of your love. You listen to our cries of pain and hear our laments. You see the fear in our eyes and know the secrets of our hearts. You do not turn from our distress, but stretch out your hand to heal, to comfort, and to save. All thanks and praise be to you, O God. Your steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Now please remain standing for our hymn number 31.
at the call to reconciliation. We call on the Lord from the depths of our pain. We wait for the Lord on the strength of our hope. Faithfully, let us confess our sins and trust in God to bring us new life and new ways of living. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, forgive us, for in the busyness of our lives, we have forgotten to seek you. Instead of looking at the glory of every single miracle around us, from the beauty of the flowers to the turning of the leaves, we have focused on completing our own tasks. We have asked for miracles, but we haven't asked for you. Help us see what you have already given us and to see all people as you see them. When we think all is lost, remind us how your forgiveness comes like the morning, leading us out of the darkness every time. Amen. Great is God's faithfulness. With God, there is forgiveness and great power to redeem. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. God has turned our mourning to dancing. Forgive us fully and freely. Our souls will not be silent. As forgiven people, we will praise the Lord. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. Now you may stand if you wish and share the sign of the peace. invite you all to join in the chorus of Will the Circle Be Unbroken? So, here we go. Come to take my mother away. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better place awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Oh, I told the undertaker, undertaker, please drive slow. For that body you are hauling, Lord, I hate to see her go. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. Does a better place await in, in the sky, Lord, in the sky? Well, I followed close behind her. I try to hold up and be brave, but I could not hide my sorrow when they laid her in that grave. Oh, will that circle 
walls be unbroken by and by lord by and by there's a better place awaiting in the sky lord in the sky i went home my home was lonely now my mother she was gone all my brothers sisters crying what a home so sad alone oh will that circle be unbroken by and by lord by and by there's a better land awaiting in the sky lord in the sky Okay. That was beautiful. I love the Bill and Bill show. They're going to be on the road soon. We never know. <laughs> now I'd like to invite the children to come up. One of our favorite people, Bob Pennock, is going to do the children's sermon today. So come on up. But uh, this is a special occasion. The shirt is special to me, and I wanted to use it today when I give this talk with these children, uh, Rosalind, Lillian, McKenna, and, and Jocelyn. It's oh, it's better. I'm not very loud, so sorry about this. But say the shirt was given to me uh, years ago, and it's the first time it's been worn. And I wanted to do it today. Mm -hmm. uh, these girls uh, showed me something that I missed, the kindness they showed when they were young. And I don't know if it was because of an old man with a white beard or was it an old man with a red beard and a white hat that got your all's attention? But I appreciate the, or maybe I should have said white beard and red hat. But they showed me a kindness that tied in with the other culture. I was adopted by the Native American people many years ago and they showed me a kindness that I wanted to express to you. And I was, Adopted into a family named Pretty on Top. And that's a strange name to have. But back then, they got the name because of where they lived. They lived on top of a pretty mountain. And that's what they were called then. And they have the members that lived together, as they call a clan. And that clan was named the Greasy Mouth Clan. I don't think they didn't have napkins or sloppy eaters, but that was, but they showed me a kindness that I wanted to bring to you. And uh, I've got little gifts for you to, uh, and two of these are supposed to be a little bit larger because the the older girls I have here. And, um, So these two is for Rosalind and Lillian. They're the larger ones, so. And these are for the other girls. Each one of these is a necklace. Where's, oh. We have one for you too, JC. With, with Jay-Z up here with us. So if she would come. Do you have yours? But. Well, let me get these out. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't bring any for the boys. I'm sorry. Well, maybe we'll get you one if you're disappointed then. Okay. But. Kind of two cultures together. 
We've got four beads here that represents directions and seasons, which is both in, and uh, also there's four we could consider the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is a four, and they have a special name. But the eight I have down here is John 3 16. Because if we take the white, well, that one don't have them on there, okay. Take the white bead as God sent his son, which is purity to earth, which is the blue bead. He shed his blood on the cross, which is the brown bead, and he died, which is the black bead, so that we may have everlasting life, which is a green bead. Now this is a circle because it's supposed to be the strongest symbol we have. And the circle unbroken was a good song to go with it. But that represents the family as a circle. And uh, get to a point where I don't know where I'm going sometimes. But anyway, that is the culture that I was with. And I would like to share it with you. And let these necklaces keep you safe for your life. And let's say this little prayer after me. God, open my heart that I may love. Open my heart that, that I may see. Open my heart that I may listen. And thank you for this life. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. for sharing your experience. Now we're going to have the prayer for illumination. Holy Lord, we seek for an understanding when we find none. Open our ears, our hearts, and our minds, and open us to our companions in faith. Teach us how to follow the path you are leading us on. Assure us that we will be safe on this path and that we will always be welcome to follow you. Amen. The first scripture lesson is Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. As human beings, sometimes we tend to complain a lot when bad things or challenges happen at one time. This is the scripture is a bit of a reminder. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the ones who seek him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. Let us humans remember that God is always with us to help. The second lesson is Psalm 30. I will exalt you, Lord, 
for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it, it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Good morning. Who here ever really pays attention to the sermon titles? <laughs> That's what I thought. Look at this morning's sermon title, Live Into Hope. Look at the end of the bottom of the bulletin, the closing hymn for today. Live Into Hope. So what do you think this morning's message might be about? <laughs> hope. But I titled today's sermon, Live Into Hope, to coincide with this week's meeting of the 226th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, USA. The General Assembly, or the Assembly, we call it in short, is meeting in Salt Lake City, Utah, having started this past Tuesday with plenary sessions and will continue through July the 4th. In fact, they're uh, having opening worship this afternoon. The theme of the General Assembly meeting is Live Into Hope. And again, we'll finish this morning's service with the hymn, uh, Live Into Hope. The scripture passage in Mark's Gospel introduces us to two persons who are living into hope. One is Jairus, a leader of the synagogue whose 12-year-old daughter is at the point of death. He's living into the hope that his dying daughter will be made well and live. The other is an unnamed woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She is living into the hope that Jesus will heal her of her disease. And this passage invites us to reflect on times we have lived into hope and calls us, no matter our circumstance, to live into hope. So through these words, Mark 5, verses 21 through 43, may we hear the word of the Lord to and for us. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet, and pleaded with him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, 
I will be made well. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid. Only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The concentric stories of the bleeding woman and the dying girl in Mark 5 have long been favorites of mine. And I know from personal experience that it has long been a favorite of many others, notably women. I've heard not a few women talk about their childhood experiences in the church and how they felt as a little girl sitting in the pew, so many Bible stories seemed aimed at someone else. Men, adults, saints, figments of history. But when Mark 5 came around, the Bible was for them. Not a few women have said that they saw themselves as the woman creeping through the crowd. They saw themselves as the girl lying on the bed. Their hearts soared when Jesus spoke as if directly to them. Talitha kum, little girl, get up. Along with featuring two women who received Jesus' healing, it's a brilliant example of Mark's ability to tell compelling emotional stories with just a few words. Mark is fond of intercalation, a narrative technique of connecting two stories by describing one as an interruption or a hiatus that breaks apart the description of the other. Intercalation invites the reader to consider two stories in light of each other, to discover more through comparison and contrast than if the stories were told entirely separately. In this particular passage, the pairing of two stories offers a rich characterization of Jesus' healing ministry and the multifaceted salvation he brings. No one is out of reach. The narrative forges connections through a collection of differences and similarities. We learn Jairus' name, but the woman suffering from chronic hemorrhaging remains anonymous. As a synagogue leader, Jairus probably enjoys some local status and influence. While the woman has lost all her money and failed attempts to treat her condition. Now, assuming her hemorrhaging renders her infertile, perhaps because of a menstrual disorder or injury suffered from a previous pregnancy, 
the woman might find herself the object of scorn or pity from neighbors and family. In any case, her decision to approach Jesus furtively while Jairus falls at his feet in front of a large or growing crowd implies that she lives with some degree of shame inflicted by others or herself. She has lived with this for 12 years, the same amount of time Jairus' daughter has been alive. When Jesus halts his journey to Jairus' house to identify the woman who has tapped into his power, their conversation has potential to uh, restore her public dignity. Not only does her ailment disappear, Jesus makes it known that he and not some hidden sorcery caused her healing. By calling her daughter, he openly declares his solidarity and relationship with her. To be saved or made well involves more than bodily health. In the context of the narrative, it suggests a holistic sense of well-being and restoration. Of course, during the delay created when Jesus interacts with a woman in the presence of a crowd excited about witnessing what he'll do for Jairus' girl, news is received that Jairus' daughter has succumbed to death. It looks as if he gave her away her chance. Jesus, though, makes it clear that this is a no-zero-sum game in which only one woman can receive a blessing from him. Both stories will end in healing, just as both stories share the question of how faith in Jesus manifests itself. Jesus identifies the woman's confident desperation as faith, and he urges Jairus to continue to have faith. Like other people of faith in Mark's gospel, these two characters need to surmount obstacles that might derail them from getting Jesus' attention. Even though the anonymous woman and Jairus face the prospect of fear, they must not let that become something that will eclipse their faith. Mark does not suggest that faith and fear are opposites. Both of them represent ways that people might respond to dangerous circumstances or conditions that exceed humanity's ability to control. Therefore, Jesus urges Jairus not to let his fear overwhelm his belief. For fear or belief in this narrative is not about confessing correct statements about Jesus and his identity, nor is it obedience to commands or following a pattern. It is rather the expression of radical trust in Jesus. It is a resolute determination born from one's sense of deep need. It is the conviction that Jesus can and will help. It refuses to take no for an answer. These are two stories about Jesus extending wholeness and blessing to individuals who would have been considered by others to have moved out of reach of such things, past the possibility of restoration and health, because they are those kinds of stories, they are stories that make readers, us, consider the possibility that nothing can keep God's holiness contained. No wonder Jesus is so magnetic in Mark's gospel, attracting people who live in desperation, yet still venture to him with a faith that insists that they are not beyond his healing words and touch. I'm going to stop short of trying to explain this passage. I think Mark does not necessarily write to explain Jesus. If Mark did so, he would not have written a narrative. Rather, Mark seems to want those who engage the text to encounter and behold this Jesus, or more precisely in Mark and parlance, to be amazed by this Jesus. The text propels us to consider when we as individuals and as church have been amazed by our personal encounters with Jesus. Now many of us will have had such dramatic encounters as Jairus and his daughter 
or the woman suffering hemorrhages. Still, most of us will be able to recount a moment when we encountered Jesus the Christ or when God's power became manifest to us as individuals or as families, communities, or church. Moving beyond explaining the text, I encourage us, each in your own time, to name, share, and celebrate our own encounters with a restorative agent of God's inbreaking realm that Mark shows us. I'm not bold enough today to relinquish the pulpit microphone right now, but wouldn't it be wonderfully powerful to invite you to name your life-giving, restorative encounters? I'd love to step aside and invite others to stand, watch, and listen with amazement at God's power to act in the midst of hopelessness and despair. If not from the pulpit today, what about, for instance, when we gather after worship for lunch in the Ramsey building? We should not lack for table conversation. So let me conclude with a few brief remarks. Too often, our criteria for evaluating the church's ministries are formed out of budget numbers or numerical benchmarks of attendance or participation. There are standards in this passage which we might consider our ministries to be participating effectively in Jesus' ongoing ministry to the world. First, Jesus crosses borders. Verse 21, Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. Jesus crosses borders not just geographical, but physical and social. We do well for the church's ministries to imitate Jesus' ministry when we carry God's healing, restorative work beyond accepted confines. And second, Jesus confronts disease and death. That is, the deep forces that marginalize and hold people in despair. We do well for the church's ministries to reach out to those who are sick, those who are close to death, those who are dealt death, and those who stand on the margins of society. Third, Jesus extends the boundaries of relationality in the household of faith. Jesus recognizes the woman he heals as daughter, like the young girl he is about to heal. In a world of fractured polarity, one of the measures of the church's mission might be how we see and relate to one another in light of the gospel. It was, I think, about five years ago, NPR highlighted a story about the 1967 hippie anthem entitled Get Together by the Young Bloods. Come on, people now, smile on your brother. Everybody get together. Try to love one another right now. The famous song was used in promotional materials for the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And an early review of the song asked, why it is not sung in the church? Like the song, this text gives us pause to think about <clears throat> how we see ourselves in relation to others and how our congregation, and indeed denominational ministries, help us live in the Jesus-enlarged vision of relationality. On the opposite end of the spectrum from recounting stories of encounter with Jesus, the question of the emissaries of Jairus' house to Jairus in verse 35 might strike us as completely arresting. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Beyond a shadow of doubt, many people come to congregational worship feeling as though their backs are against the wall. Countless human and communal scenarios present feelings of finality, unending grief, and hopelessness. 
As much as we might remind ourselves of God's powerful work, sometimes that seems like a dream too distant, a fantasy entirely too fantastic to become reality. If that is the case, indeed, why trouble the teacher any further? That this question remains in the text is no small gift, pastorally speaking. This text then presents an opportunity for permission giving, to invite people to cry out, naming the limits that impinge upon life, and inviting persons to live with what one writer calls reasonable hope, the kind of hope that holds room for doubt and despair, and at the same time offers incremental steps toward a future. The unnamed woman lived into the hope that Jesus would heal her, make her well. Jairus lived into the hope that his daughter would be made well. And when the news was received that she had died, it stopped them in their tracks and in their hope. Their hope died. Thus the question, why trouble the teacher any further? Her death, however, doesn't stop Jesus. He kept hope alive. The crucified and resurrected one is our hope. Because he lives, we also can live into hope. Let us pray. God of hope, hope does not disappoint us. When the promises of all those we trust let us down in the end, hope always keeps its end of the bargain. When the ones we believe are the role models we've been looking for shatter our illusions by the foolish choices they make, Hope continues to live the sort of life which seems so boring yet faithful. When the people we gave our very hearts to take them and dash them against the rocks of cruelty, hope stays true to the vows it made to us so long ago. Hope keeps us mindful that nothing can separate us from your love. No one is out of reach. Hope does not disappoint us. Amen. I invite you in body or in spirit to uh, stand together and let us affirm our faith citing the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. God of grace and God of glory, you created the world out of your great love and you care for all that is in it. Hear us now as we share our prayers for your beloved creation. We pray for the earth, especially mindful of the abuse it suffers under the hands of humanity. Guide us in better caring for our natural world. And may all be filled with the conviction that we are to be good stewards of your creation. We pray for the world and its leaders. May wars cease and may the lowest be lifted up. Guide those in power to visions of the greatest good. And may they be guided by your Holy Spirit more than anything else. We pray for our local communities. May they flourish and reflect your gracious view of your kingdom. Make us each bearers of grace and healing in our particular part of the world. May we be the beloved community you created us to be. We pray for Mid-Kentucky Presbyterian Terry's commissioners to the General Assembly meeting this week, Marion McClure Taylor, Perry Chang, and Meg Buckner. Be with them and all others gathered for the meeting. Through the biz busyness and business of this assembly, let your spirit rule so that our church may be joined in love and service to Jesus Christ. We ask for your special blessing upon those who are sick, suffering, or mired in grief, anxiety, and depression. May your spirit lift them into health and wholeness. And may you show us each how to be the hands and feet of Christ to them. We pray for Mary Hockenberry, Carla Wood, Sherry Gertz, Chuck Clark, Susie Crisco, Bill Anderson, Verna Williams, Reverend Don Seeger, Jake Moan and Jeffrey Smith and all service personnel and their families. No need, no person is ever hidden from you or beyond your reach to save. Remember those we have overlooked, those whom we have forgotten or forsaken and those who have wandered away from you. Restore them, we pray, and restore us too, until we're all your family again. May the circle be unbroken. More than anything else, Lord God, we give you thanks for your care and provision to all. May we live into hope and in gratitude for the grace you have shared. It is in Jesus' name we pray, saying the prayer he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. With gratitude for all God has given us, let us return our offerings to God.
pray with me the prayer of thanksgiving? Holy God, thank you for giving us a joy for generosity and a genuine love for those who are in. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts and upon our lives, that together we may bring healing and hope to the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now please join in the last hymn, number 772. Chicken is running late, <laughs> which means I can, I can offer a long prayer, we can sing some songs, or just walk slowly, but just mill about and enjoy one another. It's 10 or, I think, 10 or 15 minutes, but I thought I would offer now uh, a prayer uh, as a blessing for the meal so that I know how you all are. You're going to look for the preacher to, you know, before you can start, but... Um, so if we could, uh, let, let's have a prayer. And I, I want to share uh, one of our family <clears throat> blessings. Lord Jesus, be our holy guest, our morning joy, our evening rest. And with this daily food, impart your love and peace to every heart. Amen. I would also invite you to stay and listen to the beautiful music that Kim provides for us. Go now to where you find friends and neighbors, as well as family and strangers. We will share that never-ending love of the healer of all. Go now with that faith which dares to touch the outcast, with hearts that break for the pain of others. We will share the compassion of the friend of the broken, Go now, carrying word and wonder to a weary world, waiting in silence for the songs of hope to sing to all creation. We will follow the drier of tears wherever we are led. Friends, may the God of hope fill your hearts with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound with hope through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen.